All right. Well, thank you all for returning, although it does seem like there's more of you than, uh, <laughs> than before the break, but I can't explain that. But anyways, um, so it's my um, pleasure to do my sort of my last introduction for um, Brain Day and to, um, to introduce uh, Dr. Dennett. And so sort of figuring out how to do the uh, introduction, since many of you know as much or more about him than I do, I thought I'd focus on, um, so I guess I could tell you the things that you can find um, easily, like he's a farmer and a pianist and he collects um, antique French robotic dogs. Um, <laughs> and, um, but also I thought rather than sort of like, so you probably know as much about his books as I do, so I thought I would just sort of give um, sort of refreshment to um, sort of the philosophical origins, um, sort of as you find them if you go a little bit down the, the web pages and things like that. So he did his undergraduate degree at Harvard, as many of our speakers today did. And when he was there, there was the philosopher uh, W.V. O'Quine, who, for most of us who aren't philosophers, may not realize that he was um, a truly huge um, figure and a figure well-placed in his time. Um, so he came, uh, so Quine was a sort of an undergraduate mathematician who came to Harvard where he worked with Alfred North Whitehead. Um, during his early time on a sort of a fellowship, he met Tarski, he went and met Carnap in the Vienna Circle, and A.J. Ayer, which is all of us who speak English, is sort of how we learned about logical positivism, because we weren't sort of reading um, Carnap in the Vienna Circle. And it's um, and sort of after being at Harvard and working uh, in that as an undergraduate and working with his, on his undergraduate thesis with Quine, he went to Oxford, where he got to work with Gilbert Ryle, and um, for Again, those of us who aren't of philosophical backgrounds, Ryle's the one who gave rise to the phrase, the ghost in the machine, and wrote a book called The Mind is Concept. I think that's right. Or the, concept of mind. The concept of mind. Um, and sort of laid a lot of the, I don't know, I guess provided a lot of the origins of what today we recognize as philosophy of mind and, and uh, interest in consciousness, and sort of tried to move things sort of out of their sort of more um, sort of medieval practices, more behaviorist in their approach. And in fact, it was A.J. Ayer who was one of the readers on Dr. Dennett's uh, thesis at, um, at Oxford. Along with J.Z. Young. That's right. But, so a little bit of, uh, of uh, good associations there at the origins. So from all of that is, um, is sort of where Dr. Dennett springs from. And he did do um, an early uh, period of uh, sort of as a faculty member at the University of Irvine, UC Irvine. But since, the, um, since that time, he's been at Tufts. And most of us know, um, to some degree, more or less, uh, what he's been doing since then. And so with that introduction, I'd like to thank Dr. Dennett for joining us uh, here at Brain Day. Thank you. I, I, I can't resist adding, Britt, that um, uh, I am old enough and started my career young enough so that I actually once stood in a small group of philosophers at UCLA and listened uh, deferentially to Carnap, Tarski, and Church having a discussion. <laughs> and I, I felt very pleased to be able to be in their presence. Can't remember a word they said. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this is my favorite picture of consciousness. It's a New Yorker cover some years ago by the late, great Saul Steinberg. And if I leave it up too long, you won't pay any attention to me. You'll be so busy going through this wonderful stream of consciousness that's pictured here. There's colors, shapes. Look, there's a Stroop test there. Um, Steinberg knew what he was doing. This is, this is the stream of consciousness of one man looking at a painting by uh, Georges Braque. He's got the name right. That's identification. Object identification, meaning. We, know, we just learned where that takes place in the brain, at least in the brain of the, uh, of the monkey. And this fellow here, is, this is his thought balloon. So as I say, that's a great picture of consciousness. As good a picture I know as I know of a conscious human being. But wait a minute. Or is it a picture of a highly cultured zombie? Because a philosophical zombie, not the kind that you see in the horror movies, is indistinguishable by any behavioral test, according to the philosophers who take this seriously, from a conscious human being. 
There is no outward sign of zombiehood. And so, of course, since they're not miraculous, there's got to be something going on between their zombie ears. And what's going on in them is they have a stream of unconsciousness, which plays all the functional roles that the stream of consciousness plays in you and me. That is, if we're not zombies. But remember, you can't tell from the outside. And one of the messages of my talk today is you can't tell from the inside either. Um, this is my way of introducing what uh, David Chalmers calls the hard problem, which unfortunately has uh, echoed through the halls of uh, cognitive science even by now. And many, it's not just philosophers, alas, who take this seriously. There are actually more than a few cognitive scientists and neuroscientists who've been exposed to uh, the hard problem and they've decided it really is a hard problem and it's a real problem. And while it certainly is hard, in fact, there is no way of representing the difference between a zombie and a conscious person except vacuously with a label. I could have put a little sign on that fellow and say, zombie, or conscious person, and, and aside from the labels, there would be no way of telling which was which. Was which. Uh, so in fact, explaining the difference is very, very, very hard because you can't draw a picture of the difference, you can't have a graph of the difference, there's no empirical evidence that would make the distinction. So in fact, it's impossible. So what I've claimed ever since David Chalmers introduced this is that the higher problem is a cognitive illusion. And I want to try to explain that and convince you that you should simply be, as you are with many optical visual illusions, be fascinated by it, be, be uh, uh, entertained, amused by it, and then just set it aside as, as an illusion. So I want you to consider the Steinberg cover again, and I want you to consider it as what it manifestly is, which is a metaphorical representation of consciousness. This is a brilliant metaphor. The whole idea of a thought balloon or thought bubble is a, so it's a very natural metaphor. I don't think you, people have to have it explained to them what it means. I think kids with comic books, I think people understand it almost immediately what a, what a thought balloon or thought bubble is. Uh, and they realize that it's a, it, what they're looking at is a metaphorical representation of what's going on in the person's head. Now the task of a theory of consciousness, then, is to close the gap between the metaphorical truth of that picture and the literal truth in the brain. In other words, that picture has lots of details. There's lots of content. There's lots of sequence, there's sort of dynamic information in that picture. And let's suppose every bit of it is an elegant and apt metaphorical representation of something going on in the man's head. Now, if you can explain all those differences and in fact even predict them, then you've got a great theory of consciousness. That's one way of looking at what the task of a theory of consciousness is. Notice that the task does not distinguish explaining consciousness from explaining zombie unconsciousness. Now, some people view this as a bug in my account. I prefer to view it as a feature, since I submit that the very idea of a philosophical zombie is incoherent. So we should just set that aside. Now, that's, those are strong words. That's a harsh verdict. I will try to at least make you take it seriously whether or not you accept it is another matter. And here's my puzzle. I find the solution to the hard problem obvious. Obvious. And almost nobody else does. Which makes me reflect. And I wonder, <laughs> am I crazy? This is, there's people who say so. Uh, I mean, in, in no uncertain terms, John Searle just said, you know, this is, it's, you got to be insane to have a view like Dennett. So, well, what I'm going to try to do today is something that isn't obvious, but 
may make a difference, help you see what's obvious and what I think is obvious. So, first I'm going to start by reviewing what I think of as two undeniable truths, but some of you may be eager to deny them, so I'm going to actually try to demonstrate them or, or argue for them. First is there is no Cartesian theater, and you may not know what that is yet, but uh, I will explain it in due course. And second, there is no second transduction, and I will explain what that means. And I want to see if I can secure uh, acquiescence agreement on those two points. And then I'm going to try to provide something new. I've done all of that before, and I'll be reviewing that, which is a non-obvious account of how those two could both be true. So after reviewing some points I've been making and laboring at for years, I want to try to show how it could be true, sort of a more positive account to help you see your way around the hard problem. And to make the job particularly vivid and you might say more difficult for me, I want to give you all the experience that is, many feel, really challenging to my position. And that's a simple case of complementary color after image. So what I want everybody to do now is to stare at the white cross. Don't move your eyes. Just stare at the cross for a few more seconds, a few more seconds. And that should be plenty of time. What do you see? Everybody sees it? It works even in the back? OK, good. Now, how many of you would agree with the following? The shortest, the lowest short red stripe is intersecting the black cross. Well, you, here, let's go back. We'll do it one more time. <laughs> Just remember that sentence. The lowest short red stripe intersects the black cross. That's what we're going to be looking at. How many of you agree? OK. Now, what on earth are you talking about? <laughs> Where is it, that red stripe? It's not on the screen. It's not on your retina. Some people might say, well, it must be in my brain then. <laughs> well, here's another metaphorical, a very nice metaphorical diagram. This is from an ancient Frisbee's book, uh, Perception, some years ago. And the artist has actually done a pretty nice job of representing how the light bouncing off uh, the woman on the eyeballs and the LGN. And here we are back here in visual cortex. And hey, look, there's red lips and blue eyes and, and red stripes. There's a red stripe right there. But of course, that's an artist's license. That's, that's metaphor. There is, even though there is a pattern of excitation in visual cortex, which has roughly those shapes and dimensions. No colors. Besides, it's dark in there. <laughs> There's no red stripe in your brain. What there is, of course, is a representation of a red stripe. And it isn't red. But that representation leads you to be in the state where it seems to you to be, there seems to you to be a red stripe somewhere. But the seeming isn't red either. Nothing's red. <laughs> it just seems to you that there's a red stripe. I want to give you one more example to help you with this. I wonder if this will work in this light. You're getting rotation? How many of you are getting some rotation? Clockwise, counterclockwise. OK, good. It really works. Lovely, lovely image. So let's just walk through what's going on here. The shapes seem to be rotating. There's representation of rotation, or at least of motion. There's representation in your visual system. And it isn't rotating either. Now. 
I find interestingly enough that some people are more ready to accept that than they are that there, uh, than that are that there's nothing red. That something could seem to be rotating without there being any rotating going on anywhere is more agreeable to them that something could seem to be red without there being any red anywhere. But I submit that they are the same. In both cases, there's representation of rotation or red or whatever you want. Well, are these really representations? There's a lot of discussion and debate, controversy about what counts as a representation. And I'm not going to lean particularly heavily on it, so I'll say yes and no. And I'll try to explain what I mean by yes and no by asking you a question. Pick up a DVD. There's lots of little micro dimples in it. If you were to look at it under a microscope, are those patterns representations of red, of rotation, of middle C, and so forth on, on a DVD? How many of you say, yeah, those are representations? How many of you say, no, they aren't? All right. Well, most of you that are old enough to vote say, yes, those are representations. OK. Uh, now here is uh, my suggestion. The features in your brain are like DVD representations in one way. They're not iconic. They're not like cinema film. In cinema film, if you look at individual frames, you'll see little red and little green and so forth. Not so, of course, if you study the representations in a DVD. The representations are unlike DVD in another way, and that is, in particular, their function. The representations in your brain, the function of them is not to convey this information to a system that translates or transduces them back into iconic representations, into red rotating representations. In other words, vision is not like television. Its product is not a picture on a big internal screen. Could have been, but it isn't. Could have been, but it isn't. Because there is no Cartesian theater. Now, this is a claim that I developed at some length, oh my gosh, 25 years ago, almost uh, 1991 in Con uh, Consciousness Explained. And let me just, uh, uh, well, what I want to address very briefly is, is this claim of mine that there's no Cartesian theater, is this an a priori claim or is this an empirical claim? Well, it's both. First, I'm going to do the empirical claim. So what's the Cartesian theater? Well, here's an artist's rendition of it. This is a deliberately comic, satirical representation. And you see the light comes in and <laughs> exposes the film, which gets developed, and then it's run through the projector. There it is on the screen, ta-da. And there's not one but two homunculi in white coats in there to look at it. <laughs> now, that's a worse than bad theory of consciousness. It's a theory of internal movies, but it's not a theory of consciousness. And the problem, of course, is what's going on in the heads of the homunculi? We seem to be starting off on a regress. So, of course, that's not what it's like inside your head. But, you know, it could have been. It could have been. It really could. And I will now prove that to you. You may recognize this scene from Men in Black. That's the Cartesian theater. There's loudspeakers, there's screens, lots of buttons to push. And there's a little homunculus in there doing his job very heartbreaking scene, actually. He's dying. <laughs> and uh, the reason I like to show this is, as far as I can tell, there is absolutely nothing incoherent with this vision. This is, th there is nothing completely mind-twisting or self-contradictory about this vision. It could be that there were tiny people in another galaxy that came, wanted to pass as humans, and got themselves 
uh, uh, in the control room of, of giant sort of puppets uh, like this. Uh, and, we, you know, if we went to the planet of the giant folks, we might do the same thing. So there's nothing, there's nothing logically contradictory about the idea of there being a Cartesian theater. So that's the empirical part of my claim. When we look inside, that's not what we find. So it doesn't exist, in, that's an empirical fact. But the conceptual point, the a priori point, so there could be a Cartesian theater. If there were one, we'd have to explain the consciousness of the homunculi in turn. That's the a priori point. And eventually, the work done by the homunculus in the Cartesian theater must be distributed in both space and time within the brain among functional tissues, modules, subsystems that are not themselves conscious, but that are doing the work distributed in space and time. That's what has to be the case now that we've learned there is no Cartesian theater with an inner witness who does all that work and all that enjoying, I might add, too. Both the enjoying and the hard work, all of the responses to the conscious experiences have to be accomplished by subsequent events in the brain. So now, the tempting mistake, extremely tempting, I've found, is what I call double transduction. Um, you know what transducers are. They are systems, they could be artificial or they could be natural, which take, call it signal, in one medium and transduce it into some other medium, turning uh, uh, light into electric uh, signals of one sort or another. A photo cell is one kind of photon transducer and cones, rods in your eye are another kind of transducers. So that's transduction. You're switching media. Now, there's a tremendously tempting temptation to say that there's got to be, think about it this way. Photons come streaming in your eyes. They get transduced into spike trains. And then, and then, and then, and then. At some point, don't they have to be transduced back into colors and shapes? Or think about music. You put the record on, you put the, the, the CD on, you're listening to the music and the vibrations and the hair cells are transducing, you get more spike trains. And as far as the spike trains go, they're close as indistinguishable from the spike trains that you get for vision. And there's a temptation, but I think a less strong temptation. There's less of a temptation to strike up the little band in the head than there is to put the colors in there. But I may be wrong about that. What I'm saying is you want to resist the temptation in both cases. Because after all, if there were a second transduction, there would have to be a third transduction to get it back into spike trains so that you could talk about it, so that you could duck the incoming brick, so that you could do all the other things that we do thanks to what we're conscious of in our experience. Lay down memories, reform our bad habits, recall events in our past, whatever it is. So we want to eliminate the middle ghost the Giles ghost in the machine, but it doesn't have to be a ghost. It's also not a, a protein and, uh, and, and neuron constructed homunculus that sits in a privileged place in the brain, like that little green man looking at the screen. In other words, we want to eliminate what I've called the medium. There is no medium, there's just what happens in the brain. And all of this work, distributing all the work to the various minor peripheral agencies around, has to be done with neural spike trains all the way in and all the way out 
where you get the muscle contraction and action and so forth. So that's, I'm submitting, that's the doctrine you have to endorse if you're going to be a materialist these days, if you're going to avoid dualism uh, or other uh, uh, marginally incoherent doctrines. But it's not easy, and it, it, it looks counterintuitive. I say don't shrink from the fact that it looks counterintuitive. If the problem of consciousness were intuitive, we would have solved it long ago. You have to give up something that's deeply intuitive. I've just told you what I think you should give up. You should give up the idea of, of a medium. You should give up the idea of the double transduction and see how you can live with that. If you want to give up something else, go ahead and try. But I want you to recognize that this is an option. One option is to Consider that intuition, which I've called the zombic hunch. Recognize that it's potent, but then don't credit it. Just set it aside and see if you can live without it. Now, so now I'm ready to start the non-obvious part. This is all just sort of leading up. There's no Cartesian theater. There's no second transduction. Now the question is, how on earth can that be? Would be nice if I could replace that vision that I'm trying to discredit with something that you could find palatable, constructive, and even uh, fruitful. And here I'm now embarking in the sort of meat of the talk. I'm going to try to show you how there seems to be a second transduction because we're taken in by our own metaphors. Now, back to the DVD again. Imagine showing a DVD player to a Stone Age hunter-gatherer. I dare say that many would be convinced that it was magic. Advanced technology always looks like magic. The people who don't know anything about advanced technology it would be absolutely stunning. Suppose we ask them, what do you, how do you think this is done? Well, they say, well, maybe there must be tiny, tiny images and barely audible sounds hanging onto those shiny things. They'd be wrong. But you can see why they might make that guess. Now, there are representations of sights and sounds, but they're in another medium. Now, here's my claim. Anybody who thinks there's a hard problem is making the analogous naive error about consciousness. They're thinking, there must be qualia in there causing the appreciation, the beliefs, the behaviors, and so forth. I don't see how it could be anything else. And I'm going to try to show you how it could be something else. And now, at great risk to my credibility, <laughs> I am going to endorse what I'm calling the coffee machine theory which I'm calling this because of an anecdote, an event that happened to me some years ago. I was somewhere in England in a university setting and there was a coffee machine and I put my coins in the coffee machine and it went and pushed the button and it went buzz, whir, click and no cup dropped down into place and the coffee drained out into the drain right in front of my eyes. <laughs> and the person I was with said, now that's automation for you. It not only brews and pours you a cup, it drinks it for you. <laughs> <laughs> now, that is the unpromising ground of what I want to tell you about my theory of consciousness. It's the same kind of theory. A good theory of consciousness shows not only how the brain produces experiences, it shows how it consumes them. And if you don't do the second half, you're not, you don't have a theory of consciousness. You do not have a theory of consciousness. You got to do the whole thing. How it reacts to them, how it uses them to guide behavior and so forth. Now that's the point of what I've called the hard question. 
I raised the hard question with a capital H, capital Q a few years before Chalmers came up with the hard problem. And the hard question is very simple. And then what happens? You have a theory of consciousness and you say, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun, here we go, we up, up, up into the middle, and then ta-da, we have consciousness. Oh, why do you say so? And then what happens? Tell me, please, what difference it makes that now we have consciousness. What, what's, what sequelae follow and how does your account explain the sequelae? And if you don't even attempt to answer that question, you are simply abdicating your responsibilities as a theorist of consciousness. If you don't answer the hard question, you're stranded in the Cartesian theater with a mystery. But it's really hard to answer the and then what happens question, although I think great progress is being made on it these days. Uh, back in uh, October, as it was, yeah, I was in Brussels for a very nice uh, uh, conference, not unlike this, and uh, Jean-Pierre Changeur, an old friend of mine, was there uh, giving a very nice, these are his slides, giving a very nice account of the theory that he and Stan DeHaan and a few colleagues have put together. Uh, Toward a molecular biology of conscious processing was his uh, nice ambitious title. And I'm not going to go through all the slides that he had except I want to show you, oh, you can see it's almost sort of cut off at the bottom of the screen. Hypothesis, long range axon neurons broadcast signals to multiple brain areas, oh, yeah, the very most important words don't show up, yielding subjective experience. Yielding subjective experience. And this is a uh, slide many of you will have seen. This is, again, the Changeur slide. I'm not going to I think, by the way, very highly of, of the Changeur de Han theory. I think it is a, a, a extremely well thought out and, and has a lot of data in its favor. So I'm uh, uh, something of, a, of an advocate uh, of, of their theory here. But I want to point to some words here. Um, the global workspace with long range axon neurons broadcast signals to multiple areas yielding subjective experience of being conscious and reportability. That's what I want to concentrate on. He says only one sudden and coherent spontaneous ignition equals brain state and global neuronal workspace <coughs> activation. Um, okay. In my terms, that's the winner in the competition of the multiple drafts. Now, <sighs> permit multiple areas to share contents, yielding subjective experience. Well, uh, in Brussels, I asked Shlomo, uh, I said, uh, OK, uh, yielding subjective experience of being conscious and reportability, um, you know, that's not actually very eloquent. What do you mean by that? I don't think you mean that it generates uh, a Cartesian theater. Oh, no, no, of course not. And it doesn't mean that there's uh, events occurring in another medium where there's a, no, 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 of course not. Well, what does it mean? And his response was, I thought, quite wonderful. He said, why don't you tell me what you think I should mean by that? <laughs> and I thought, fine. That's a very good role for a philosopher to take on, and I'm glad he's asking me to do it. And it ain't easy, and he knows it isn't easy, because he doesn't know how to answer the question himself beyond what he said, and it's not very convincing. And he acknowledged that, too. So now I'm going to try. I wish Schlonger were here so that he could criticize my attempt to answer the question that I posed to him that he realized he couldn't answer. 
several parts, and they are all a little bit half-baked, and that's what you're going to have to settle for. We are unwilling creators of fiction. All representations of the contents of consciousness are metaphorical in some regards. I've already shown you the wonderful Steinberg thought balloon, and that, I've said, is metaphorical. But I submit that no matter how hard we try, when we wax introspective or phenomenological and start talking about what it's like to be us, we end up using phrases like, well, it's as if, it's as if there were a red stripe on the wall, or what is it like? Famous Nagalian Nagels, what is it like to be a bat? So it's like this, it's like that, it's as if. And what we should recognize is that in putting it this way, we're almost acknowledging that we do not have any terms at our disposal for a literal public description of what we're talking about. And so we fall back on metaphorical language. Um, some uh, philosophers who've heard me say this are not sure they understand me or, or, or they think it's got to be wrong. One that's particularly constructive is Eric Schwitzgabel in 2007. He wrote a, a, a piece challenging me about this. And uh, uh, he said it made his headache. Uh, okay. I appreciate that because I think it is a, it is a hard to accept strange idea. I'm going to try to make it a little less headachey uh, by trotting out a thought experiment about the prims. I'm calling them prims because they're imaginary primitive people. There's never been people just like this. And, uh, but I'm just, so bear that in mind. So the prims are a tribe somewhere out of all contact with the rest of human, human beings. And they have only three categories in their language. Everything is either animal, plant, or unliving, rock. Sort of like the old 20 questions game, animal, vegetable, mineral. So as far as they can say, their conceptual scheme is restricted to these three rather procrustean categories. So what we do is we bring a few of them to our civilized world for a while, and then we let them return to their people to tell them what they experience. And they arrive back in their native land quite agog, and they try to tell their countrymen what they've, in, what they've experienced. And they say, well, there are these slender, woody plants with black centers, which mark the strange white leaves. There's hard-stemmed, leafless plants growing out of shiny, hard rocks. <laughs> There's animals that swallow you whole and spit you out unharmed. <laughs> now, these are unwitting fictions They're, or metaphors. These people are not trying to tell lies, trying to tell fictions. They're not trying to use metaphors. This is simply the best they can do. They're telling as close to the literal truth as they can muster given their resources. Okay, moral is, of course, I'm saying that's what we do all the time when we talk about our inner life, when we talk about our qualia, about the, the nature of our perceptual experience, what's going on in our heads. That's the best the prims can do, and it's, it's how it seems to them. Now, this seeming is something which is which depends on what you know and what you understand, quite clearly in the case of the prims. Well, how does this seeming happen? Here, we have to resist the temptation. What is it made of? What's seeming made of? Well, how about mental paint? Um, two philosophers have actually endorsed this term and talked about mental paint. Now, 
that puzzled me because I thought I had uh, already sort of prefuted that idea in Consciousness Explained, where I had an abusive term for this view. I called it figment. Figment was what you painted your inner life out of. Said there's no such stuff as figment. Well, abuse isn't enough. You've got to have arguments, apparently. And uh, 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 so Ned Block, undaunted, uh, has gone on to talk about mental paint. I submit that that makes no sense unless you've succumbed to the, to the temptation to have a, a second transduction into a medium in where this mental paint can do some work. Well, let's remind ourselves, what's the end product of perception? Conscious experience? No. No, it's not, actually. It's like the end product of apple trees is not apples. It's apple trees. Apples are an intermediate product on the way to more apple trees. And the end product of perception is successfully controlled behavior and updated memory and so forth. Now, how that's accomplished, how the perception is mediated on the inside is something about which we have lots of hints but no direct access. So oddly enough, I'm suggesting that you and I, contrary to Descartes' view of this, we do not have privileged access to the machinery that does this hard work in our brain. We have lots of hunches about it. We have illusions of, sort, of sorts and those are data, but they are not veridical data. They are, they are phenomena that themselves require explanation. And that's what the question, and then what happens, is it supposed to answer. First, let me say a little bit more about what I think is the systematic vacuity of the hard problem. Uh, David Chalmers gave a TED talk a few weeks ago, at which I was present. And it will, if it's not already on the air, it soon will be on the website. And I recommend it because it is as short and brief and articulate and eloquent an 18-minute version of his view as you could ask for. He did it justice. But I viewed it as breathtakingly close to a reductio. And in particular, he's now and flirting with what he calls panpsychism. And by the way, he's caught several interesting cognitive scientists in his web with this. Christoph Koch and Giulio Tononi. Stunning. Bacteria are conscious. Proteins are conscious, carbon atoms are conscious, even photons are a little bit conscious. Now, uh, you'll see maybe why I think this is um, tantamount to a reductio. And then what happens? Okay, you got your conscious photon, just a little bit conscious. Please tell me, how does it differ from a photon that isn't conscious at all? What happens, thanks to its smidgen of consciousness, that makes a difference? About this, silence. There's no, no predictions, no explanations, no differentiations. There's just nothing there, nothing there. So, you know, we might compare it with um, pan-niftyism. Everything is nifty, <laughs> including photons. Okay, and so what? What's the difference between a nifty photon and a not so nifty photon? It's just a vacuous view. How does a nifty carbon atom differ from a non-nifty one? Okay, that's why I submit 
the hard problem, the way to solve the hard problem, remember I think this is obvious, is simply to deny that it's a real problem. Deny that there's a Cartesian theater, deny that there's a second transduction, and now you've got the still very difficult question of answering the hard question, and then what happens? How can we explain the phenomenology of consciousness if we abjure the idea of this special medium? And I'm going to lean lightly on the global neuronal workspace, fame in the brain. That's fame in the brain is my version of it. It's not transduction, it's informational integration. It's coalescence of consilience of different elements. There's no need for a show in another medium. There's plenty of show in a way. There's lots of discrimination going on. There's lots of responding going on, but it's not, not going on in another medium. It's going on all in the same medium of interactions between cortical and thalamic and so forth, all those different areas. And I'm gonna say a little bit about how it might work. And here I'm going to lean lightly again on the recent paper of Andy Clark's. I noticed that um, Chris Elias Smith has a, one, co-authors one of the comments on this. Uh, Andy's paper, Whatever Next, is about um, Bayesian predictive coding models of the brain and he's uh, quite sanguine about the prospects of using this idea uh, to uh, uh, break through some of the log jams in cognitive science. I think he may be right. Um, I highly recommend the article and the commentaries and his response. And I'm going to just give not so much a sketch of what he says as an application of what he says, explaining it a little bit as I go along, to the questions that we're dealing with here about consciousness. And I'm going to use an example um, that I've used before, which I think is particularly good at making this point. In the North Carolina Museum of Art, there's a wonderful painting by Bellotto. And by the way, the painting is just about the size that you see it up here on the screen. It's a big painting. And I remember when I first saw it, I walked into a room, not as big as this room, saw the painting across the room, thought it was probably a Canaletto, and Canaletto had all this fantastic obsessive detail. He had the buckles on the shoes and the, every line on the boats and, and uh, feathers in the caps. And I thought, oh boy. And I started moving towards the painting because I wanted to see, in particular, I wanted to see the costumes of the people crossing the bridge in the sunlight there. And as I got closer, thank you, Museum of North Carolina for providing these slides for me. As I got closer and closer and closer, I realized the detail wasn't there at all. It was artfully done by Bellotto, and it was so striking to me that as I approached the picture and got closer and closer, I actually yelled out in surprise because the details I was sure I had seen from a bit greater distance as I got closer, they weren't there. Surprisal, was I, I was predicting something else and my prediction was confounded when I went to get confirmation of it. Now the spots suggest people with arms and legs and clothes and so forth. This is the genius of Bellotto that he could do this. And the brain, my brain at least, takes the suggestion. All right, now what does that mean? Does it mean that little homunculi in my brain were busily painting in arms and legs and feathers and caps and spokes on the wheels? No. No. When the brain takes a suggestion, <coughs> the brain is forming a set of expectations. Not by painting a picture for itself to look at, 
But by just generating the most likely Bayesian expectations of what to come next, and then they don't get confirmed. And those are very general expectations, but they don't get confirmed. And that's why I express surprise. Now what's going on here, I submit, is a very general phenomenon. I want to give you another example that may clarify this, or may not, we'll see. Let's consider cuteness as a property. It might seem to stand to reason that we adore babies because they are cute. I submit that's just about backwards. Basically, they're cute because we adore them. That is to say, they have facial proportions that are evolutionarily established to trigger cuddling, nurturing, uh, uh, kichiku, oh, aren't you cute responses. And that what happens is those reactions are kindled in us by our visual, present, visual uh, uh, analysis of our visual stimuli. And then we project out onto them this property of being cute, which is not an objective property in the world so much as a uh, subjective and emotion-laden property which we project out. Now, to get clear about that, I think it helps to ring in Jimmy Gibson and the ecological approach and his concept of affordances. And while I'm at it, I'm going to ring in the philosopher Wilfred Sellers and his distinction between the manifest and scientific image. Now the manifest image that Sellers talks about, that's the world we live in. That's the world of solid objects, tables and chairs, people, opportunities, free will, etc. And the scientific image is proteins and leptons and quarks and gravity and so forth. So the manifest image includes affordances of all kind, to use Gibson's term. Affordances are those things in the environment that matter to you because you can do something about them. So sweet, sexy, cute, funny, these are all affordances. Colors, solidity, causation, free will. These are all aspects of the manifest image, other minds. And in every case, or in almost every case, there's something that is very naturally called projection of a property that is properly internal and affective. And hence, an action tendency. According to the Gibsonians, when you see a cup, your reach out to grab the cup is automatically activated. You don't have to reach out, you can suppress it, you don't have to do it. But the fact that a cup affords picking it up or putting liquid in it, this is sort of built right into the very identification of the thing as a cup. And here, one more philosopher to add to the fray, and that's Hume, and I'm going to call it Hume's strange inversion. We misinterpret an inner reaction as an outer cause. Hume, of course, was talking about causation. Um, oh, I didn't leave my Hume slides in here, so I'll be very brief. Famously, Hume argued that we don't actually see causation. Causation isn't a property in the world which causes us to see causation. Causation is actually our anticipation of an effect caused actually by, by conditioning, sort of Pavlovian conditioning in our brains. We've seen A followed by B, A followed by B, like, like Pavlov and the dog, A followed by B. Now, when you see an A, we expect a B, and it's that expectation, which is an internal subjective reaction, which we then project out into the world, and we think we're seeing causation in the world. We think that it's the causation that we're seeing in the world that is causing our 
belief that we've just seen causation. He says it's the other way around. It's your belief, it's your expectation which causes you to have the illusion that you're seeing it out there. I find my students have trouble with this until I say, if Hume weren't right, animated cartoonists would have a real problem because in addition to the soundtrack, they'd have to have the cause track. We wouldn't see causation when, when Roadrunner, when the anvil falls on Roadrunner's head, we would just see first A and then B, but in fact we see it as a causal relationship. You don't, they don't have to draw it in extra. It's in there automatically because we supply it. Now this Humean projection is, I think, uh, not just about causation. I think it's, a, it's an, a ubiquitous feature that needs to be accounted for. And I'm going to, uh, I'm running out of time, but I'm going to be quick about this. I'm going to use a little anecdote about Ned Block to make the point clear. Ned is famous for his distinction, his purported distinction between access and phenomenal consciousness, um, which I think is mistaken. I'm not going to argue about that. That would take me too long. But I'm just going to tell this story, true story, about something that happened once, where Ned was in a laterality test, um, not dichotic earphones, but a visual laterality test to see how strongly lateralized for language he was, left hemisphere, right hemisphere. So what happens is you look at the square, like the square, I mean, you look at a target, like, like the target on the flag case, and a word or non-word is flashed in either the left or right hemifield. And your decision is word, non-word. And if you're strongly lateralized left for language, then you're quicker and more accurate on the words that are flashed in the right hemifield, because you're left lateralized for language, uh, than you are on the words that are in the left hemifield. It's a well-known uh, standardized test for laterality. And some people are, you know, you can be more or less strongly lateralized. So Ned had just been in such a test, just because he was curious. And I said, and how did it turn out, Ned? Did you turn out to be strongly left lateralized? He said, yeah. He said, and then he went on to add, and you know, the words on the left seem somehow blurry to me. I said, oh, really? Which was it? You had trouble seeing the words because they were blurry? Or they seem blurry to you because you had trouble seeing them. And he realized he couldn't tell the difference between those two. Well, I submit that the latter is almost certainly the right way to think about it. He's interpreting his difficulty and it's producing in him an illusion of blurriness, which he then reports. So if this is right, then he, he, uh, Bloch is just failing to make what I'm calling the Humean inversion. He has a pre-Humean view of causation in the mind. He thinks phenomenal consciousness is the causal basis of access consciousness, when in fact it's an effect of access consciousness, not a cause. And that this is actually misleading him and a lot of people in their research. So projecting is a very natural metaphor, and it cannot be literal, obviously. We don't literally project out, I don't know, through our eyes. You know, there was a theorist not so many years ago who actually took that idea seriously, thought that there had to be some kind of a projector in the brain which projected colors onto the front surfaces of objects in the visual world. Well, it takes all kinds. Well, if, the, if project, it's, a, it's both a very natural metaphor, but if it's also metaphor, if it's only metaphorical, what on earth could it mean literally? Here's where I think Bayes comes into the picture. Bayesian predictive coding. Every affordance yields a predictive action tendency. It sets up a sort of forward model, which we then read backwards, more or less. 
We're designed by evolution to perceive as many affordances as possible. Oh boy, there's a funny tape. <laughs> wow, how did that happen? We should have anticipations about everything that matters for us. Among the things that matter to us is ourselves. In addition to our expectations, we have expectations about our expectations. When we see a baby, we not only feel the urge to reach out and cuddle, we expect to feel that urge. Our satisfaction of that expectation confirms our perception of cuteness in the baby. The satisfied expectation of our expectation is the projection. The familiarity of an object in your visual field, in your perceptual field, such as that red stripe, is constituted by the lack of prediction error in response to the hierarchical layers of outbound signal. This tacit confirmation is what licenses entry of a new object to be considered, thought about, and talked about in your ontology. That's what makes cuteness seem real. It's what makes the red stripe seem real. It seems to be there because you expect to see it, and what happens then? You do, for a while, see it. Then what happens? You judge that it really was there, all red and real. What lies in the middle is not another medium, but a virtual self, a center of narrative gravity, a user illusion made of information. Now, some people hate this idea. Here's Jerry Fodor. If, in short, there's a community of computers living in my head, there would also better be somebody who's in charge, and by God, it had better be me. <laughs> you count on Jerry to say, with great vividness and gusto, exactly the opposite of what you really want to hold. Uh, if Jerry didn't exist, I'd have to invent him. Yeah. But he's not the only one. I like this one. Daniel Denner is the devil. <laughs> There's no internal witness, no central recognizer of meaning, no self other than an abstract center of narrative gravity, which is not, itself nothing but a convenient fiction. For Dennett, it's not a case of the emperor having no clothes. It's rather that the clothes have no emperor. Yeah. <laughs> of course. If you still have an emperor, you haven't begun your theory. It's as simple as that. You still got an emperor there in the middle, you haven't, you're back in the Cartesian theater. Now compare that with David Chalmers says, if you don't have the subject in your theory, you're evading the main issue. Well now one of us is dead wrong. That is the hard problem. Oh, there's one more critic I recently discovered, and I've got to name him too, because I think in all these cases, what you begin to see is that people, there's a lot of affect involved here. There's a lot, of, people are very anxious about this. I mean, this is calling me the devil even. You know, they really don't like it. These authors are fascinating because they try to explain away their own conscious experience, their own qualia. As the philosopher John Searle puts it, how could an intelligent person paint themselves into such a corner? They certainly give it a good try, as, but as well as being crazy, it's also, of course, dehumanizing. They end up saying that we are all some kind of deluded zombie or machine. Well, I'm saying there's no difference between a deluded zombie and a conscious person, and that we should simply abandon the idea of philosophical zombies, recognize that some of our best friends might be zombies, <laughs> and none the worse for it. Thanks for your attention. Um, I don't think that consciousness is a well enough defined phenomenon. In fact, I think it's a whole family of phenomena. And yeah, I would, I would say it has, a, it, it has a little bit of the sort of stuff that consciousness is made of. 
but then so is a thermostat. Uh, a little little bit. That is. Hmm? Well, well um, no, I think it has more to do with um, uh, information utilized for control. And yeah, in some at least extended sense of computation, I guess that's always going to be computation. I think that's why there's no question that our brains are computers of a sort because they're for controlling our bodies and getting us through life. And that's a, that's a process of computation. It's information in, adaptive behavior out. Yeah? So do you think modern day computers are at all a little, little bit conscious? And if not, will they ever be? Um, same question, really, but let me, <laughs> let, me, let me see if I can put a slightly different slant on it. Um, I think what matters sort of morally to us yeah. is not the sort of consciousness that computers now have, and we probably wouldn't, shouldn't want them to have that, because if they really had that, then they would have affect and emotions, and things would really matter to them, and they'd really care. And I don't think we want that, and I don't think we need that for most applications. Um, interesting that the new RoboCop, have you, any of you seen that? No. Well, um, it has, a, it has a, a, a character named Hubert Dreyfus, Senator Hubert Dreyfus, who's the, the good senator who's arguing against robots uh, being put in sort of human social predicaments. And it turns out that the, the good scientist is named Dennett, Dennett Norton. <laughs> um, and, and he believes in, in sort of robot consciousness in a certain way. Anyway, any rate, it's, um, I think that that movie does a pretty good job of articulating, if not solving, the concerns that motivate people when they worry about whether computers could be conscious. And I think, uh, in principle, of course they could. Yeah. But they w almost certainly won't, and for pretty good reasons. Mainly, they would cost the moon to make conscious ones, and we'd rather have unconscious ones. But they'll be a little bit sort of conscious. They won't be conscious in the way that matters. As in now or in the future? In the future. Yeah. Why do people go to the theater, the uh, Cartesian theater, or the second transaction? What's the reason why? Like, what was the reason that it came up? Is it because Descartes was obsessed with the soul, or? Yeah. Uh, that, that may be. Um, now, Descartes is actually very interesting in this way because Descartes was a really good materialist naturalist and he was unflinching in saying for instance that a sheep was just an automaton and Arnaud his contemporary said are you telling me that light could bounce off the head of a wolf into a sheep's eye and cause that sheep to flee he said yeah yeah that's within the bounds of the sort of Materialism, he espoused for everything except human beings. He thought we were different, the only species that were different. And maybe that had something to do with his Jesuit upbringing and his desire to find a place for the immortal, immaterial soul. But I think, I think there are, as it were, more presentable reasons for thinking that there's an inner theater Sure seems to be one. I mean, after all, we can, we can close our eyes and enjoy a good daydream, and that's sort of like going to the movies. And we gotta be able to explain phenomena like that. And I think we can without, uh, without succumbing. Oh yeah, that raises an interesting point. Um, Let's think about Sherlock Holmes for a minute. I hope I'm not destroying anybody's illusions, but he never existed. He was not a real man. <laughs> fiction, fiction, fiction. And 
we don't have to invent fictoplasm to be the medium in which Sherlock Holmes exists. Because he doesn't exist. The only medium we have to, well, we have to deal actually with several media. We have to deal with print, we have to deal with movies, we have to deal with television, and we have to deal with what happens in our own heads when we read a Sherlock Holmes mystery. Now, people are tempted to think that what happens in their own heads is sort of, this is turning a fiction into a movie and then watching it. I think they are wrong to think that's the right way to think about it, but you can see why they're tempted to think that way, because they are adding content. They're adding content which is not, in, not on the page. But the more you think about it, I think carefully, you realize that they're not adding content uh, the way you have to if you make a movie. Right behind them, yeah. I'm, something I didn't get in your, in so your, when I looked at that yeah. illusion, there was a red, and yeah. you say, is there really a rep any representation of that? I say there's representation, there's just no red. Let me, let me, let me see if you and I are on the same page. Um, I think there are people in this room that could and may already have modeled complementary color after images in a computer program. Now, if you have such a program, how do you tell whether you've modeled it right? Well, I, you know, I beg to differ. I mean, I think that if we looked inside the model and saw that given the, um, uh, refractory periods and, and refresh rates and so forth and so on, uh, and the opponent process system that this was feeding, and we saw that uh, when we then presented the, the green, black, yellow flag to it, that um, a few seconds later when we gave it the gray screen, we would see the activity in that model which showed red, white, and blue. And if we wanted to be tricky and cute, we could, uh, we could have the model, so we asked, what country does that remind you of? And because it had a representation stored in memory of what an American flag looked like, it would say the USA, and it would tell us why. Now, there's a tremendous temptation, I think, this is what I want to get at, for people to say, oh yeah, but that doesn't have what we have, how, that would not model the experience we have. I said, well, how do you know? Well, what makes you so sure? I think it does. I don't think that what we have when we see that red, white, and blue flag is in, a def, in another medium. It's in spike trains. It's not in, in silico. But there's no extra, there's no rendering of the flag in either case. There's no rendering in the case of the computer. And there's, or if there's, there might be something you might call rendering, but it wouldn't be rendering in another medium. It would just be some further visual representation. That's I.
I confess that I am a second-hand or third-hand student of Heidegger. Could never make it through the actual Heidegger, even in English translation, and instead have all my career relied on two Heidegger interpreters, Bert Dreyfus and his student John Hoagland, I preferred the latter, uh, to tell me what Heidegger was all about. Judging by what Hoagland said Heidegger is all about, I think we probably agree on some things. I found that Heidegger a fairly congenial mind, but I'm not, as I say, I don't, that's, that's an amateur uh, response to a second-hand or third-hand interpretation. Should we take a pause here at this point? Mm -hmm. I said, I think we probably should, uh, we've been going for an hour and 15 minutes, and um, I mean, we can sort of let the larger group uh, yeah. disperse. And sure. Okay. So let's uh, thank, uh, we'll adjourn our last talk, and we thank Dr. Denham one more time. <laughs>